High Point University Presents, A Conversation with Wes Moore and Nito Cobain, is a production of UNC-TV in association with High Point University. Hello, I'm Nito Cobain, president of High Point University. We're delighted that you're joining us tonight on the campus of High Point University. We frequently bring very talented uh, men and women from across America and the world to share their ideas with our students, to create an atmosphere for discovery and for dialogue. And today we have a very special person. You're going to like him, and you're going to hear his ideas, and you're going to find that he's influencing people and impacting our world in measurable and meaningful ways. You know, there are two Westmores. One is in jail right now in Maryland for killing a police officer. The other one is right here. Both of them grew up poor. Both of them had learning challenges. Both of them lost their fathers at a very young age. What makes a difference? Wes, what made the difference? It's, uh, that question is the question that drew me to this entire process. Of, of trying to understand that at the same time as I was getting a Rhodes Scholarship and I'm heading off to England uh, on this scholarship that another Westmore was beginning to serve a life sentence in prison. He's now in year 15 of his life sentence. And uh, it's interesting because I think the thing that I learned throughout this process was there was no one thing. Uh, I, I wish there was. I wish there was a simple thing that we could say if you can just give this to a child or help a child do that, then the child will be just fine. And uh, you know, I, I realized throughout this process and through my own life is that raising kids is amazingly complicated. Mm -hmm. And when you happen to raise kids in some of the most precarious and, and dangerous communities of our country, it's that much more complicated. Now, I, I've come to learn and believe that, uh, that I will challenge anyone who wants to tell me that every child is born with the same amount of assets, right? Uh, that potential is universal but opportunity is not. And the difference between those two and the space between potential and we all end up is where we all can collectively come in. So issues of family, issues of faith, issues of housing, issues of policy, and importantly, issues of expectations have to come into play. And, uh, and I remember someone said to me, they said, it's a real shame that you lived up to your expectations and Wes didn't. And I said, actually, the real shame is that we both did. And I think that has so much resonance over these two individual stories and, frankly, over all of our stories. Mm -hmm. You wrote about this in your other book. Uh, we have all of our students at Hyper University are reading Wes's uh, book, The Work, but his other book is called uh, The Other Wes Moore, to which we are referring to the other gentleman. Um, you, uh, you, you're a Rhodes Scholar. Um, you are a veteran. It was a very weak year. It was a very weak year. <laughs> yeah. I doubt that. I'm quite familiar <laughs> with the process. Um, and uh, you're a decorated veteran. Uh, you are um, working on television, both on the Oprah Winfrey Network and public television. Uh, you have now written a couple of books that have become bestsellers. You're traveling across America and the world, um, leading seminars and helping people. And I'll get in a few minutes to some other very important things that you're doing. I, I was intrigued um, in your book when you talked about a person who is very dear to all of our hearts at High Point University. That's General Colin Powell. Mm. You may not know this, but General Powell serves on our National Board of Advisors at wow. High Point University. And he has spoken here. He is a wonderful person. Yes. And you refer to his book, My American Journey, as a book that influenced your life in measurable ways. And then you say that um, uh, since your dad died when you were four years of age, you, um, you, you didn't have a dad who could write you a letter about life and all of its anticipations, but you went to General Powell's book yeah. and you read the letter that he wrote to his son. And I've marked it for you here. You. And I want to hear it in your own words, if you don't mind. Mm. Would you read it from here to here? Absolutely. Wow. It's a lot to me. You now begin to leave childhood behind and start on the road to manhood. 
you will establish definitively the type person you will be the remaining 50 years of your lifetime. You know what is right and wrong, and I have confidence in your judgment. Don't be afraid of failure. Be more afraid of not trying. Take chances and risks. Not foolhardy actions, but actions which could result in failure, yet promise success and reward. And always remember that no matter how bad something may seem, it will not be that bad tomorrow. Mm. That's powerful. Mm. Thank you for reading it. Thank you for asking me to. You know, um, in, your, um, in the afterword, your first book, Tavis Smiley says the central message of that text can be summarized by a quote from playwright Samuel Beckett. Mm. Here's the quote, try again, fail again, fail better. What might it mean to fail better? And what is the role of failure in reaching success? You know, I don't, I don't know if you can actually have true success without also understanding what failure is mm -hmm. and what failure looks like. Because if all you have seen is success, it means you haven't really reached hard enough. You haven't, you haven't tried hard enough. Um, you know, I always think in, in my life, the things that have been the most useful experiences for me have been the things that really pushed me. Where the things where, as General Powell says, where success was not a guaranteed thing. Anything that I've gotten easily, it normally was never worth my time. Um, and I think we have to be able to go into life with an understanding that not everything is going to work out. You're not going to bat a thousand. That's perfectly fine. You know, if you look at baseball, people who bat 350 end up in the Hall of Fame, right? Your bigger concern isn't necessarily being successful at everything you do. Uh, the biggest thing that you have to make sure you're focusing on is, am I trying to address one of the world's great needs? And if I'm trying to address one of the world's great needs, then I'm doing what I should be doing, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You have to put together the plans around it. You have to make sure you're prepared. You have to make sure you have, you know, you, you have a model that can actually work and grow and scale. You have to do all that stuff. But if your goal every time you step up to the plate is simply say, well, it's more important to me to bat a thousand than it is to actually swing for the fences, then I'm not sure if you're the best player or you're gonna be the most, uh, you know, the most essential piece mm. to the team. You know, Wes, in this uh, very theater, I teach a class for all freshmen. So all the freshmen that you will speak with tonight actually take my class. I see them every week. Mm. And um, we talk about life. We talk about what life can give us and what we must give it. Uh, I quote people like William Barclay, too, you know, who said, always give without remembering, always receive without forgetting. Um, I say things like there are productive uh, failures, which is really what you're talking about, and there are non-productive successes. Some people mm -hmm. succeed and know not why they succeeded, and therefore they cannot replicate it. Uh, sometimes failure is the road to getting us where we need to go. Okay, so... Um, I want to take this class. Well, um, I would have to check out your SATs first, but nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless, we will, we, will, we will try to be forgiving. So you may have forgotten that Rhodes Scholar stuff. That's, That's been exactly some right. years ago. Um, I, like, I like what you said on, one, on page 120 of your book. It just relates to what we're talking about. You said, one thing I began to realize in my travels was that everyone I met who was truly successful, whether in business, in philanthropic work, in human rights, in government, or in raising a family, shared one common trait. They were fanatically passionate mm. about the work they did. They breathed it. They needed it. It was their lifeblood. Yes. I agree with you so much about that. Yes. Here's my question. Where does one find that passion? How does one maintain that passion? How does one get other people to feel that passion? Well, you know something I think, I think I've come to believe and realize is that it's not even so much about a person having to go find that passion. That passion's there with you the whole time. The, the, the thing that we have to do as individuals is be prepared and be diligent about blocking out the noise, right? Because you're always gonna have noise around you. You're always going to have people with ideas and thoughts, most of, most, of it, well, most of which are from people who love you deeply and are just trying to give you the best advice that they see fit. But if you are not 
thinking seriously about what is it that, that, what is it that breaks your heart that you're willing to give everything for, then you'll never be able to find that answer. I mean, think about it. You know, think about all the successful people in, in, that we all know. The thing they all have in common is not their gender or their race or what, where they're from or their family background. It's the fact that they all know that this is why I'm here mm. and this is what I'm supposed to focus on. I, I had a, uh, uh, a mentor of mine, actually the former, former university president of Johns Hopkins University, and I was getting ready to go into finance after I came back from the military, came back from Afghanistan. And he sits down and he says, so, you know, what are you going to do next? And I told him I'm going to go into finance. And he said, uh, really? And he's like, um, so what's the reasons why? And I started going over the reasons why, and I, you know, I felt like it was a skill set that I could be good at, and I you know, wanted to specialize, and I wanted to help take care of my family and my grandmother and my mom. And, and he said, listen, Wes, he said, um, you've just spent five, five minutes telling me about why you're doing this, and not once did the words, because I'm passionate, come out of your mouth. And he said, listen, I will never judge you on what you do, nor will I ever judge you for the things that you think that you're doing is in the best interest of your family. However, the moment that you feel like you've accomplished everything you need to accomplish there, leave. Because every second you spend doing something that you are not passionate about, you become extraordinarily ordinary. Isn't it, uh, I mean, I think it's a philosophical discussion which comes first, purpose or passion? What's your take on that? That's a good question. Um, let, let me just let, what, me, let me rephrase that. Yeah. So, so I, I think that that one defines their purpose. I think it was um, um, a famous writer who said the two most important days of your life: the day you're born, the day you discover why. Mm -hmm. So, I think maybe purpose comes first. That leads to passion. Passion then leads to energy, right? You're very energetic about all the good things you're doing. And energy leads to action. Action gives us the opportunity to succeed. Success leads to significance. Yeah. Significance ultimately takes us to the one place we all so desire, which is happiness. Yeah. Am I right or wrong? When you put it that way, you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> How do I disagree with that? No, no, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. I think the, 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 the thing I would say, though, is um, I almost feel like this idea of purpose and the idea of passion, these are two beasts that move alongside one another, yeah. right? Because I think that, you know, if you, you it, it almost really becomes impossible to find that one without finding how the other one immediately uh, submits to it, mm -hmm. right? where you have a sense of purpose in this idea, but, it, but very quickly that has to submit mm -hmm. to this passion. Because there's one thing we know about, all of us, about the work that we do and the work that we choose to do, is um, you're gonna have hard days. You know into it, guarantee it, guarantee it, because if, if these things weren't big problems, then they would have been solved already, right? Um, and the thing that I think I've noticed is that if you're not purposeful and passionate about that work, then hard days have a tendency to become last days. Uh, you'll find something else to do. You'll find something else that'll take your attention and take your time. Uh, the reason that we know we're doing what it is that we're supposed to be doing is you can have a hard day and still wake up in the next morning and say, give me more. And that's when you know you have found that purposeful passion and the work that you're actually supposed to be doing. And that's why we all need heroes, models, and mentors. Exactly. Right. That's what you're doing in your work. You're being a model and a mentor to so many. You know, we like to say that who you spend time with is who you become. Mm. So if you have, mm. if you have purpose, um, you may need some, some guides in your life to help you really discover that passion. Some people have purpose, but they don't know what to do with it. Right. And so I think it's all about uh, choices in life. You've made great choices. He made bad choices, the other West Moore. That's why you're here and he's there. Um, let me just read you one other thing. One of the people that you speak about in the book is the guy who had the kind bars. Mm. Tell us the story of the kind bars. Yes, so uh, my friend Daniel Lubutsky, uh, fascinating guy and, and, and an entrepreneur to his core. I mean, Daniel is, Daniel will find a way to be an entrepreneur with everything that he does. Um, and he was having a chance to travel, travel around the world, and he was traveling in Israel and such, and he said he, he had, he took a bite of something, it was almost like a tomato paste bar that he said it just that taste he said I never forgot it 
And he said, so why couldn't I go and have something with you know, natural ingredients and you know, good food and all this kind of stuff, but also use it for a purpose? He's always really big into, into this idea of being kind. And so one thing he would do was he just set up these platforms was like, okay, send me, send me a note uh, about someone who thinks deserves a smile and I'll do something kind for them and that kind of thing. And then he figured out a way of actually having his entrepreneurial spirit of these kind bars then match up with a fulfillment of his purpose and his passion. And so everyone sees these kind bars around airports and you know, all these kind of delicious, delicious bars. But what people don't know about those kind bars is it's not just because Daniel's looking to increase his P&L. Daniel takes revenue from that and because he says, I want to make sure, I want to create peace in the Middle East. I want to create, I want to use, use the revenue to create, a, you know, to forge a, a peace between Israelis and Palestinians. I want to be able to take this work and, and have people come in and say, okay, well, we want to have, you know, kind Fridays. Tell us something that's interesting to you and we're going to send a care package over to soldiers overseas who are overseas fighting. I just want to be able to use this gift of entrepreneurial creativity and success as a way of sharing kindness around the world. And I love the idea, and it's, it's great because actually I see it, I see it through, the, through the DNA of what you all are doing here at High Point, is how do we create an entrepreneurial culture that also supports humankind? Where Daniel understands that you know, we can have blended bottom lines and have this thing work, that you can create something that does well and does good at the same time. And that's one of the reasons I was so inspired by Daniel's story and so many other people that I featured in the, in, the, in the work, is that we can be creative, and we also can be fulfilling, and we also can be successful, and there's nothing wrong with moving as those spaces collectively move together. And you say, um, you say in your book, I began to recognize that the best decisions I had made in my life were the ones where I let go of fear and had confidence in myself, my training, and my God. Ironically, each success fostered a momentary amnesia about its foundation. This mm. is, this is mm. good stuff. I found myself in a complicated place where the more successful, successful between quotation marks, I became, the more I clung to safety, safety between quotation marks. Almost as if I had completely forgotten most of the tenets <laughs> that had made me successful in the first place. What's that all about? It's, I, you know, th this was one of, the, one of the really complicated dynamics that I think uh, you have to wrestle with success, right? Um, where I think there's a relative level of imposter syndrome that I had as I was coming up. And the imposter syndrome is actually, it's, it's a real psychological term, but it's where you feel like everywhere you go, you feel like you're an imposter. Like someone's about to find you out. Someone's about to tap you on the shoulder and say, what are you doing here? You know, you don't belong here. And I think a lot of it because you think about, you know, my past, you know, your past, the past of so many other people, where we have seen things that no one ever expected us to see. We've sat in seats, we've been in rooms, we've been part of conversations, we've led conversations that no one ever expected us to be privy to. And with that, there is this sense of fear that comes along with it where you say, so if I say too much, is my ticket now going to get pulled? If I go too far out there, is someone going to say, your time is up? At what point does my runway run out? And I think the thing that I was wrestling with at that very point was the thing that made us successful was the fact that we were willing to push. The fact that we knew that every room we were in, we weren't there because of someone's benevolence. We were there because we belonged there. And if that's the case, why then should we stop it? Because we now feel like we've started to actually taste what success looks like. Our job now is to push even harder. Our job now is to speak even louder. And so what I wanted to understand and what I think I came to the point of understanding is that you're not in the room to be silent. You know, if you were there just to be wallpaper, then someone else would be, should be in that seat. You're there because you belong there. And you're there because your job now also becomes to make sure you can push that door open as wide as possible and to let as many other people as possible mm -hmm. see that success and see that opportunity that you've been blessed to see as well. Don't you think, Wes, that, that um, the most successful person in the world is the one who's focused on others? That uh, as you lift yourself up the ladder of success, 
you really are not watching the wrongs you're going up. You're watching the people alongside of you. In other words, the most effective, most sustainable leaders are always looking beyond themselves and saying, how can I help this person up? How can I make this project better? How can I make this community safer? And so on and so forth. The people who, who, who focus on themselves in terms of success um, are never fully happy. Yeah. Because how do you define success? With what measurement? Quantitative or qualitative? Right. You always want to get to the next level, the next level, the next level. Yeah. But when you see it in other people's life, which is what you've done, which is why you're, you're at Hype University, because we, we want our students to be exposed to men and women who have done something significant in life and whose heart is in it. And, and you know, and I, and I would say too, I also see when you have people who don't work to forge that for other people, they also don't even understand the origins of their own success, right? True. They don't understand that you're not there only because of just how hard you worked and how much mm. you sacrificed. Mm. You're there because there were people, some, some people who you might not have even met before, who woke up in the morning thinking about you. Mm -hmm who woke up in the morning opening doors for you mm -hmm. and, and, and paving pathways so your walk could be a little bit smoother, mm -hmm. so your avenue could be a little bit easier. There are people who I owe everything I have to, not just to my family and to my loved ones and my friends and mentors, but there were people who I have never met before, mm -hmm. who I know I'm sitting here mm -hmm. because they were doing that. And it then goes back to why are we here? You know, my sister said something that I will never forget. She said, one of her definitions of hell would be one day God showing her everything she could have accomplished mm -hmm. had she only tried. Mm -hmm. Think about that. The mm -hmm. definition of hell will be one day God showing me everything I could have accomplished had I only tried. I try to live my life so that one day when that conversation happens, that the only thing that he can say is job well done. And that's all I believe we have to fight for. He's laid out this amazing and this beautiful path for us to walk down if we're only simply willing to go after it. Mm -hmm. That's why God breathed in your nostrils and gave you life. Yes. To give you a purpose. That's right. As long as we enjoy the gifts and keep our eyes on the giver. Amen. That's, that's I think, the important point. So, so your whole work has been about a life that matters. What makes a life matter? We've talked about service, we've talked about helping other people. But when you speak to these, uh, basically, teenagers later tonight, what are you going to say to them about what makes life matters? I, I think the thing that I want to talk about, and even this idea of the work, right, what our work is, is that our work isn't necessarily our occupation. A lot of times people say, well, where do you work? Um, you know, where do you work is an important question. What is your work? is the more important question. Mm -hmm. And when I think about this idea of the work, it is this point when your world, it's when the world's greatest needs begin to start all overlapping with your greatest passions and gifts, and you actually choose to do something about it. That's stewardship, isn't it? That's exactly right, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. So how do we define, how do we find, define, and then execute on our work? And so when I think about the life that matters, it's knowing that when you had a chance to do good, when you had a chance to address that thing that hasn't been addressed, when you had a chance to lead instead of follow, when you had a chance to be part of something bigger than simply yourself, did you move on it? Did you act on it? Was this something that was a major priority to you or was it something that you were willing to let go by and just assume that someone else was going to take care of it? And the other, and the other argument I would say about it is this is not simply just about you know, doing good and what's right for the world. I also just think it helps to make life more interesting. You know, I, I, had, a, I had a chance to uh, uh, interview Harry Belafonte once. Uh, Jamaican Jam of origin, like That's you. That's exactly right, Irie, Irie. Can you do his voice? Can you sing a song? I would, and I'd embarrass myself. Uh, <laughs> in, in, um, but you know, it's funny because my, my family loved Harry Belafonte coming up, both because of the Caribbean background and so on and so forth. And I say, my grandmother loved him because of his tight pants and all that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we also loved him, my family loved him because of his social conscious, for the fact that he was always involved in social issues, um, you know, whether it be about war, whether it be about poverty, whether it be about apartheid, whether it be whatever, he was always front and center on it. And so I had the chance, to, I had the pleasure of interviewing him and, 
you know, people were asking questions about his performances in Radio City and his performances in Carnegie Hall. And when it came to my time to ask a question, uh, I said, uh, uh, there are many celebrities, athletes, authors, et cetera, um, who when it comes time to get involved in controversial issues, social issues, they say nothing because they're afraid, you know, people won't see my movies, they won't listen to my songs, they won't buy my books, they won't whatever. And I said, but you never did that, why? And he gave an answer that I thought was fascinating. He said, because it's just more fun to live that way. Mm. And he said, uh, this was a few years back, and he said, um, some people wake up in the morning and they call their accountant. I wake up in the morning and I call Nelson Mandela. Who do you think has a more interesting life? Mm. And it was the idea that even if you're not gonna do this to be selfless, do it to be selfish. Because service to others also just helps you to live a more interesting life. That's enlightened self-interest. That's exactly right. So, um, so leadership is a big thing for you. We talk a lot about leadership, what it means to be a personal leader, a group leader. What are some qualities that you value in a leader? Mm. You know, I, I, I think about the leadership that I've seen in, in the military, in the private sector, and in government. And I think there's, a, there's, there's kind of three threads that ties all of them together. One is a person needs to be extraordinarily technically competent, right? I mean, uh, you know, and I'm not saying you need to master everything because that's human, it's, it's humanly impossible for you to, to know everything better than everybody else. You need to make sure you have good people around, but you need to be technically competent to know what you're doing, have a bigger vision, and then be able to think about how do we get there. Um, you need to be able to use common sense when it comes to the type of purpose. No history, no future, and know where you fit in all of that. And then the third thing, and arguably the most important thing, is you need to take care of your people. You need to show compassion. You need to show empathy. Because if you take care of your people, your people will take care of you. Any type of deficiency that you might have, and all of us as leaders have a certain deficiency, certain things that we wish we could do better, but we can't, or whatever the case is. I could go on for hours telling you mine. Mm -hmm. But when you have really good people, nobody ever knows. Because they make sure you're covered. Mm -hmm. They make sure that the things that might not be quite right, they're quite right. And so that's when I think about leadership in all these different facets. If you can make sure that you are technically competent, if you make sure that you're using common sense and compassion, and if you make sure that you take care of your people, it's amazing how these other things fall into place in a way that they need to fall into place. Walt Disney said, um, we take good care of our people. Our people take good care of our guests. Our guests take good care of our prophets. Mm. That's really what you're saying mm. in so many words. And you wrote in your book, no, not in your book. It was in an interview with the NACUBO, National wow. Association of College and University okay. Business Officers. Uh, you were interviewed about what is the role of higher education in this ever-changing world. And uh, you cited those three points. You said that, in fact, I have the exact quote. Uh-oh. Uh, in, 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 writing, <laughs> in writing, it was just a little bit better than the way you just said it. <laughs> Here's what you said. You said, being able to pursue and complete higher education is an opportunity and achievement that matters on different levels. One, it gives you evidence that you know how to complete something, yes. complete something, yes. and never thought of it that way. That when you go to college and finish college, you actually complete something. It shows that you actually know how to persist, and that matters to employers, partners, and loan officers, of course. Uh, it also enhances your skill set, as you just cited. The third thing is that it broadens your network. You're talking about higher education, your network, your connections, your friendships. People forget that the majority of jobs in this country don't happen through classified ads or through an online job portal. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, 70% of the jobs in this country are gained through connections and networks. If we're not able to open up these networks, and we do not allow more people to tap into that level of social capital, then we're doing a real disservice to our students, to their families, and to our social and societal elements. Mm -hmm. I happen to agree with you, my friend. That's pretty smart. I, th I think 
Please, Mark, who wrote that again? Well, that's smart because I, <laughs> I said it with such eloquence. That's exactly I read right. it so well. <laughs> okay, I think no, that's, that's right. I think that's very smart. Well, you know, I and, think and, that's very smart. And I think it, it goes back to this idea. And people, it, it's it's a statistic that I think so many people are so surprised by that the majority of jobs in this country are never even advertised because they're filled before they have to be advertised. Mm -hmm. So 98% of our graduates at High Point University find a job or go to graduate school of their own choice within six months of graduation. Mm. Now, I'm very quick to tell people because we invest so much energy, so much time, so much effort, faculty and staff alike, in ensuring that we create for our students opportunities yes. in which they can be involved, we can excel, can grow in wisdom and maturity, and it's done through internships, through career services, through experiential learning, all kinds of ways. We, we agree with you. We believe that the future is gonna be more demanding than the past of young people. Uh, those freshmen you're, you're gonna be speaking to are gonna meet competition from way beyond the boundaries of America. They're, they're gonna be meeting people from BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, countries in between, countries beyond, and it's gonna be demanding. They, they're gonna be tested. Their logic is going to be tested. Their reason is going to be tested. Their knowledge of the world is going to be tested. Let's, let's talk about some fun stuff. Yes. Wes, what's your favorite hobby? Oof. Um, fishing. I love fishing. And you know, it's interesting because... Are you good at it? I'm horrible at it. And, um, <laughs> but you know what's, what's interesting? Fishing, hiking, all that kind of stuff. And it's odd because I'm a city kid. You know, I grew up in cities my whole life. I grew up in big buildings and lights and barking dogs and sirens. I mean, I'm a city kid. Um, so one of the reasons that my wife thinks it's fascinating that I really got into the outdoors was actually through the military. It was the first time I got a chance to experience the outdoors. The first time I got to experience the forest. I mean, the only thing I knew about the forest before was this is where folks go in horror movies and don't come out of, right? <laughs> so, so the idea now of, of loving camping and fishing and hiking. Um, it's about much more than just the activity for me. It's about that my mind was opened up, and, uh, and I appreciate that. What quality do you admire most in people? Compassion. I, um, I'm inspired by people who are compassionate towards others and compassionate towards folks that they don't necessarily have to be. You know, I, I actually think, you know, I remember someone once asked, they said, uh, is the problem that we have, particularly when you're looking at, you know, lower income, minority black communities, has there been a breakdown of the family? Um, and I said, I actually think there's been a breakdown of the definition of family. I think that we somehow think that simply because a person is your blood, that that's the only person that you're responsible for. Um, we have to broaden the definition of family as well, in addition to building up the family. And I think that's where compassion comes in. What do your kids like the most about you? <laughs> um, my presence. Uh, being a husband and being a father is the greatest joy. Uh, and I thought it was great before I became a father. And it's even better now that I've become one. Uh, and part of it was because, you know, as, as, as you said, and I, I didn't grow up with my father. Um, so I always had this idyllic vision of what fatherhood would be like, and it's even better. And uh, that's something that I think that not only did I miss most, but something that I pay the most attention to now isn't necessarily giving them a lesson or isn't necessarily, it's simply being present. How did you and Dawn meet? It was an arranged marriage, actually. Um, eHarmony.com, yeah, no. <laughs> Well, you know, so we, I mean, we laugh and say it was an arranged marriage, but in some ways it was because her aunt and uncle were friends with my aunt and uncle. And they had been talking about, oh, you know, my niece and my nephew, or, you know, my, you know my, my aunt and uncle say, oh, my nephew and her, you know, oh, my niece. Finally, I got a chance to meet her aunt. And she said, you should really meet my niece. You know, she's in the policy, she's in the public service, she went to the University of Maryland, da da da. I'm like, oh, that's great, you know, um, that sounds wonderful. So we'll grab coffee sometimes, because you know, sometimes you never know how those things go, mm. right? Um, it's been a long time for me, <laughs> let me tell you. I, uh, I've forgotten how that goes. <laughs> Besides, my wife is in the audience, thank you very much. <laughs>
Good answer. Right. And, uh, and then finally, um, I was like, okay, we'll grab, we'll grab coffee, because you know, coffee, coffee can be done in 10 minutes if you need mm -hmm. to be done in 10 minutes, right? Um, and as soon as she opened the door, I was like, oh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> and coffee turned into uh, dinner, and that dinner turned into a five-hour conversation. No, it <laughs> wasn't that great a night. It was a, uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> just dinner. Um, and, uh, but that night, I, uh, I met my best friend. That's beautiful. Give me three adjectives that uh, Dawn would um, use to describe you. <laughs> the ones she'd use are the ones I'd wish that she would use. Um, sincere. Spontaneous. And godly. And maybe, maybe honest. honest <laughs> yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Um, okay, Wes, you failed in your life, right? Oh, yeah. A few times. <laughs> what was your biggest failure? And what did you learn from it? Hmm. Well, one thing I know, listen, I mean, I, 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 I've probably failed a half dozen times today. Right, I mean, there were, and sometimes it's, it's, it's something big, and sometimes it's a missed opportunity. I should have called this person and I didn't. I should, you know, so all those things. And I think that's just part of the, our natural evolution of life. Um, God, there have been so many. But I, I'd say that, um, you know, one failure that does sit with me is a failure to recognize how hard people were sacrificing on my behalf. Um, you know, when I got sent away to military school, I, when I, so when I was 13, I was, uh, I had a, yeah, I was a little naughty. And, uh, and I had a mandatory year where I had to go away. And um, it ended up becoming one of the more important decisions that was ever made on my behalf. Um, but I didn't realize how hard people had to sacrifice in order for me to be there. I mean, the, the school I got sent away to, it wasn't free, nor was it even cheap. I mean, it's thousands of dollars, and mm -hmm. a thousand dollars my family didn't have. Mm -hmm. And my mother started like writing letters and notes to friends and colleagues and saying, I really want Wes to do this, but I can't afford it. Um, can you help? And people gave, you know, a couple hundred bucks or 50 bucks or whatever it was, and she was still thousands of dollars short. My grandparents, um, my grandfather uh, grew up in Jamaica, my grandmother's from Cuba. And when they came to this country, they saved up for years because they wanted to, they bought a little small home in the South Bronx in New York. And it wasn't just because they wanted shelter, but it's because they actually wanted to own a place. They wanted to own a piece of this country. And their plan was to stay this house, and then when it came time for them to retire, they were going to sell it and move back to Jamaica. Uh, and um, when they found out that my mother was going to be short, they ended up mortgaging that home and taking the money out and giving it to my mother so she could uh, afford this school. And um, in the first four days, I ran away five times. And I was this close to getting myself kicked out. And they would have then lost everything. I think the biggest failure and the biggest embarrassment that I have in my life um, was a failure to recognize how many people were rooting for me and how many people were advocating for me. And, um, and the selfishness that I, uh, that I approached life. Now, granted, listen, I, I was young, and you know, as the good book tells us, you know, when, when we're a child, we do childish things. Um, but in retrospect, there was never an excuse to have such a lack of appreciation for the love that people had for me. Gratitude is a fundamental for life and living. It it's amazing the number of people who are not fully grateful to live in this country. To understand the freedom and the opportunities. Uh, at High Point, we shouted from the mountaintop. We're a God family and country school. We, we, we believe that uh, to be a patriot doesn't mean you have to agree with everything your country does or doesn't do. To be a patriot, in fact, is to care so deeply about your country that you'll try to make it better. And sometimes you will disagree. But to respect the fundamentals, the principles, the tenets that built in the first place. And that's why we like you, because you talk about these principles and tenets, what, how, what words might one see in 100 years 
as your epitaph. You know, I, I think the, uh, I think I'd want them to see words that weren't mine, but words that were my grandparents. And um, before I deployed to Afghanistan, my grandparents got me a little pocket Bible. Um, and this pocket Bible, you know, one of the small, New Testament Bibles. And it was small enough that actually it could fit inside of my, uh, my flak vest. So whenever I'd go out on missions, I'd stick this Bible inside of my flak vest, right over my heart. And... Um, and in it, my grandfather wrote the words, have faith, not fear. And I remember I would say that right before we went out on every mission, and I just kind of say it to myself, have faith, not fear, have faith, not fear, have faith, not fear. Because I knew where we were about to go do. I knew the missions we were about to go on, and I knew that there was a, a relative sense of fatalism that came into every mission that you went on. Um, and that was okay. Because as long as you had faith, and not fear, you are gonna be all right no matter what. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what I, uh, that's what I'd love for people. That's what I want the epitaph to say, that's what I want people to say is that, you know, he had faith and not fear. And faith, not fear. I told my children, um, have faith and have courage, put the two together, you have faithful courage. Mm. You can mm. make amazing things when you have faithful courage. You can do anything. What are you going to say, or what do you say to college students? I mean, you're, you're very tuned to the notion that 34% of freshmen in college today either drop out or they simply don't even complete the first year of uh, the college years. And therefore, they go on to have lives that are less successful than they could be. Uh, we work hard on this institution with our first year experience. Uh, we assign every student to a success coach. We try to help them track their life and make sure that this is the beginning and gets better and better as they go on. Yeah. What is it that you would say to students about how they can make this world a better place? How they can use their talents to meet the needs of the world in a meaningful, purposeful, impactful way? Mm. Um. I think I actually go, through, I would go twofold on that. Um, one is I think it's really important for students and all of us to understand why higher ed is important. I, I get in this debate all the time with people who want to tell me, well, college is not that useful anymore. And, you know, and it's just like, listen. And, and the examples that they always want to give me are you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, et cetera. And my point to them is this. Listen, I, I can't argue with the outlier examples that you lay out. However, had Facebook never amounted to anything. Had Apple simply been a fruit, right? Um, Steve Jobs would have been just fine. So would Mark Zuckerberg, so would Bill Gates. Uh, and that's also not who I'm talking about, and that's also not who I'm fighting for. Um, we have to make sure that people understand why completion is so important, going back to the points we made before. And the second thing I would say for all students is, you know, when you walk onto a college campus, you're going to be immediately hit with questions of what's your major and what are you studying and what class are you taking and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and those are all really important and good questions. Uh, but those questions will fade and people will stop asking. People eventually will stop caring what your college major is. Um, the question they will always want to know, though, is who will you fight for? And I think that's the question that I think all students have to go into college wondering and in some ways have to leave college knowing. Who will you fight for? Because, you know, and, and it has, you know, it's, it's sometimes that answer is not an easy answer. It's not a simple answer. Um, it's not, oftentimes, it's not the politically correct answer. Uh, but it's the answer that you know is most God-honoring and fulfilling to you. And so that's where I think kind of that virtue of higher education uh, becomes really important in all this. We tell our students at Hype University, uh, and I think it's akin to what you're saying, that, that you have no choice anymore but to be extraordinary, that average is out, excellent is in, that excellence can only be measured with relevance, mm -hmm. only relevance. At some point, someone's not gonna care how intelligent you are. They're gonna care how relevant you are 
to the team, to the organization you're involved in. We tell them that you can no longer compete only with your strengths. Mm. Strengths are prerequisites, that you must compete with your differences, that you must exit an ocean of sameness and through a lake of differentiation, but ultimately you gotta swim in a little pool of distinction <laughs> if you're gonna make something worthwhile of your life. And then we say that you have to have a growth mindset, that you go to college not to just uh, study or memorize or just make a good grade in a class, all those may be important components, but rather to, to, to stretch your mind, to discover and to uncover and to learn to think beyond the horizontal into the vertical, mm -hmm. the diagonal modalities of thought, because ultimately that's what's gonna allow you to build bridges of understanding with other people right. and do the kinds of things that you are effectively talking about. Right. I'm intrigued by one thing, Wes, I'm intrigued by many things, but here's one thing that intrigued me about your, your uh, master's degree thesis. Mm. What was it on and why? It was on the rise and ramifications of radical Islamism in the Western Hemisphere, uh, which is a very long way of saying I was looking at groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and Al-Qaeda and kind of the growth within the Western Hemisphere. And the thing that first got me interested in that was prior to 9-11 through the military, I started hearing more and hearing more chatter about you know, a ton of individual groups, everything from fundraising and such. Uh, and then obviously after 9-11, there was just a greater sense of context to this work. But I, I, I became really interested because I said, this isn't, an inter this isn't only an interesting military execution question. This is a really interesting philosophical, educational thesis question of how exactly do groups grow? How exactly do things go, you know, before the word viral was something that everyone knew, how do things go viral? How do you, you know, why was it important for groups to grow inside of border regions and not inside of the middle of countries? So I really wanted to get into and understand how these phenomenons take, phenomenons take place and what can we learn from them and what then become the long-term implications. And so the thing I loved about my research was this wasn't something that I could just go to a library and figure out. And, uh, so you went to Syria and Lebanon absolutely. and Iraq and Egypt. And I was all over the place. And I was, you know, <laughs> back when I, when, I, when, I, when I was growing hair, uh, could grow hair, um, I had this big afro and a big beard. And I was hanging around, like you said, in Syria and Lebanon and, and Argentina and Brazil. And I mean, going all over the place and just trying to better understand the tri-border region of Paraguay, you know, Paraguay, Uruguay. You know, so it's just trying to better understand what was taking place mm -hmm. and how this growth happens and what was there to learn from it. And what did you conclude? Uh, there was a few things. One was I, I concluded that the, the, the lifeblood of, of these organizations, and really any organizations, it's money. If you don't figure out a way to cut off funding, you'll never be able to figure out a way to be able to control growth. Uh, and the, the, the interesting and fascinating thing was the diversity in ways that these organizations were able to make money. Uh, you know, people look at it now, even with the growth of ISIS, where they say, well, they're taking over oil fields and they're, you know, and, and, and all that stuff is, is real and true. I mean, the, part of the challenge of dealing with ISIS right now uh, isn't necessarily that, oh, it's a, you know, how do we control interest of people recruit, being recruited? It's also about how do you control the fact that they're able to make millions of dollars a day? Um, you know, when you go down to Ciudad del Este, and you had, you know, big green pots where people were, you know, kind of donating, almost making like, you know, tithes and penance towards Hezbollah, right? How do you go about addressing that? How do you go about controlling that? So one, the importance of, of, of money in it. Uh, two, the importance of why border regions became so important for them to grow. And the reason I, I conclude is actually pretty simple is that border regions are generally regions that are not controlled because no one has to take responsibility for border regions. If, if you have a country that goes stops here and I have a country that stops here, anything that goes on right here, I'm just simply saying, well, it's your fault. And you're simply saying, no, it's his fault. And so basically means no one takes care of it. And so border regions are incredibly fertile areas for people to be able to grow and scale. And then the third thing that I, that I took from it was that philosophy is important, but human conditions are more important. You can believe something. You can say people are doing something because of religion or people are doing something because of an ideology and all that stuff is true. 
But one thing that I know we learned in Afghanistan was, you know who the most dangerous person to us in Afghanistan was? It wasn't necessarily uh, you know, the, the, the ideologue from Al-Qaeda or the ideologue from the Taliban who says that women shouldn't go to school and so on and so forth. The most dangerous person we had in Afghanistan was the guy who hadn't worked in 23 months. Mm -hmm. Because the guy who hadn't worked in 23 months, he has no problem when someone walks up to him and says, go stand on the top of that mountain, and when you see an American convoy roll by, just push send on this cell phone, which then sets off an ID, and for every confirmed kill, I will give you 75 US dollars. That So you see, Wes, what, what you just said, these are, these are very interesting and intriguing arguments. They feed into the notion that we have to understand the globe in which we all reside, that we have to appreciate our uh, differences and be grateful for our similarities. But that all of us, at the end of the day, as Maslow taught us all, have the same basic needs. And that if a person is hungry or feels unsafe, then they will act and react in certain ways. It is not unlike what we see in America, mm -hmm. that the growth of people who get in trouble, where they become drug dealers and go to jail and so on, because occasionally, if not often, they are unemployed and they're looking for ways and then they get themselves in trouble. I like what you write in the book, which is the whole notion that our work must be all-encompassing, that we are our brothers and sisters keepers, as the Bible says, that I love uh, the person who lives in Syria just like I love the person who lives in North Carolina, that I love someone who may be a Christian or a Muslim just the same, because they're created by God Almighty. And when God created us and breathed in our nostrils, he didn't make differences among us, whether we're white or black or Republicans or Democrats. He saw us as his children. And I think our greatest mission is to try to seek that understanding, is to try to build bridges of understanding, is to have less conflict, more collaboration and cooperation, which, which feeds into what universities are all about, that we are about learning about each other and finding ways to get along with each other and finding ways to invest ourselves mm -hmm. in manners that can create for a better world for one and all. It should be a win-win relationship, shouldn't it? It should never be win-lose or lose-win. It should be win-win relationships. So Wes, let me, let me sort of ask you this in, in closing. What's next for Wes Moore? I... Um I, I feel like my North Star is I want to be useful. I, uh, I've never been one that's been driven by a title or a job position because um, you know, I, I know people that have no title that are doing remarkable things in the world, and I know people with really, really big titles who, in my opinion, are doing absolutely nothing in those jobs. Um, so title and a position or a seat has never been something that's moved me. Um, but what's moved me, and what will always move me, is am I being most useful? Am I, uh, am I taking advantage of opportunities? And am I creating and forging new ones for other people? Um, and I think that's the thing that will always then push me and keep me, whether it's the work that we're doing with higher education, whether it's the work that we're doing on reforming the juvenile justice system, whether it's the work that we're doing you know, with, 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 our, with our kids in Baltimore and making sure that they feel like there's a, that as we're having a bigger conversation about the future of our city, that there's a place for them too. These are things that I think excite me because I feel like that's where my work lies and where my work will continue to lie. So, um, so what's next is uh, I want to continue being useful. You ever met the other Westmore? Yes, I'm now, I've known Wes for over a decade now. In fact, I was with him two days ago. And what do you talk about when you see each other? <laughs> you go visit him, I take it. I do, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about family. We talk about uh, the situation right now for so many kids in Baltimore. Um, and it's really interesting because oftentimes when I, when I uh, when I speak to Wes, and I remember when I first asked him about his opinion of the book after he first got a chance to read it, he read it, I'd say, probably about four or five weeks before the book was released. And, um, That's the first book. The first book. Mm. And, uh, and I asked him his thoughts, and he said he had two main reactions. He said one was it was amazing how much research I did to it, because I mean, I did hundreds of hours of interviews 
with him, his friends and family, my friends and family, just to really make sure I was getting the facts and the feel of the story right. Um, and the other big reaction that he had about the book, he said after reading about his life in a book like that, it amazed him how little that he's done with his life. And uh, to hear that from somebody, and again, this is not, you know, this is not cast from revisionist history on Wes. It's not about reopening cases. You know, Wes is in year 15 of a life sentence. Um, Wes will be in prison, as he said, until he's carried out. But to hear him talk about how every opportunity that he's ever had in life, he's wasted. And even he then gave me the motivation and the fire behind writing that first book, where he said, if you can do something to help people understand the consequences for their decisions, and also do something to help people think about the neighborhoods that these decisions are being made in, then you should do it. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, became the fire and the focus, not just behind that project or, or the work, but about so much of my life's work, is if you can do something that can be impactful and lasting, why would you choose not to? You're doing important work, my friend. I do, yeah. And we're delighted to have you on the campus of High Point University. We wish you great things as you move on your journey of life, uh, planting seeds of greatness in the minds, hearts, and souls of students and adults alike. And I know that our paths will cross again. Thank you for being with us well, today. Thank you so much. And God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I appreciate it.